If you think life's hard today, with the harsh economic climate, global warming, and the ever-present struggle of deciding what to binge watch next, just imagine the Middle Ages. They didn't have global warming, but believe me when I say that their issues were just as bad if not worse. In today's video, we will be looking into a year in the life of a medieval citizen. Just how bad or good was it in the Middle Ages? But before we get into that, be sure to subscribe and support interesting videos every day that you wouldn't want to miss. Let's go away. Let's start by looking at January 1347. After a long previous year of being harassed by the Bourbonic Plague, you finally accept your fate that you might actually die at any time. Turns out, the world might actually be ending sooner than expected. The joy that once accompanied the beginning of the new year is no longer there. The once vibrant village square, filled with laughter and busting trade, now lies eerily quiet, haunted by the specter of death. You never thought that you'd actually experience such a serious pandemic. Yes, you had experienced the common outbreaks that normally killed a few tens, but this one, or the one that threatens to wipe out the whole village, is a discovery. You reflect on the tales your late grandmother, the oldest citizen in your village ever, used to tell you and your 17 other siblings, and you realize that this might actually be just as deadly, if not worse than the other pandemics. Yet, you are still hopeful that someday normality will be restored. March 1347. You attend the public persecution of Thomas the Blacksmith. As you settle into the crown, you can't help but wonder what mischief old Thomas had gotten himself into this time. Rumor has it that he tried to convince the village that he could forge a sword so sharp it could cut through a dragon's scale like butter. Of course, the only dragon he's ever seen was painted on the local tavern sign. But you think to yourself, prosecutions due to lies are so 1100s, so it definitely can't be that. As the trial progresses, it becomes quite clear that the reason for Thomas's persecution is because he had not delivered on his promise and not as the rumors portrayed. The poor guy had assured the village he would fix the local military tools by sundown yesterday, preparing for an anticipated raid by the Larval village. However, come sunset, the tools remain broken and the raiders indeed attack the village. Today's mode of punishment, the ducking stool. As the villagers gather around the water's edge, you can't help but feel a pang of sympathy for Thomas. Despite his tall tales and failed promises, facing the humiliation of the ducking stool seemed a harsh sentence for a simple case of procrastination. Yet, justice, as they say, must be served, even if it involves a dunk in the village pond. This is just but one of the many modes of punishment you have witnessed over the years. There is the stock and pillory, where offenders are publicly humiliated and subjected to ridicule, branding, leaving permanent marks of shame for their crimes, whipping or flogging, a painful reminder of wrongdoings to all to see, banishment or exile, casting individuals out of their community to fend for themselves. And let's not forget the ever popular beheading and hanging reserved for the most serious of crimes, bringing swift and final justice to those deemed deserving. With all this, it's still a mystery how anyone still commits crime. June 1347. The good old-fashioned enemy of the people, famine, is back. Just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, the crops fail and the granaries run empty. Perhaps the plague has finally reached all the farmers. Oh yes, the plague still exists. The two meals a day luxury has now been reduced to a meal per two days and boy it's expensive. The dove toll this year is definitely expected to rise to unprecedented numbers. September 1347. Your village is inhabitable. Turns out the famine has hit hard, to a point where the remaining people are actually departing from it. Your successful uncle, a baker who lives in London, invites you and your remaining 16 brothers and one sister to seek sanctuary in the busting city. It's a bittersweet offer, knowing that leaving behind the only home you've ever known means abandoning the memories of childhood, laughter echoing through the now silent streets. But desperation outweighs sentimentality, and the promise of food and shelter in the distant city is too tempting to resist. Your uncle's invitation comes with a twist. You'll be sharing a two-room apartment with his eight kids and three wives. Not ideal, but it'll do. Perhaps it could also be a blessing in disguise, providing you with the perfect opportunity to finally venture into the city on your own and finally start a life. December 1347. The end of the year arrives with a bitter chill. The toll of the past months weighs heavily upon you and you reflect on the losses suffered within your family. Seven of your 16 brothers have been claimed by the unforgiving hand of fate, five succumbing to the ravages of the bubonic plague and two falling victims to persecutions of the law. You question yourselves on the value of the life you're living as nothing makes sense anymore. 
To add to the mounting challenges, you receive news that your uncle's bakery in London can no longer sustain the needs of the extended family. Reluctantly, you realize that you must return to the village where familiar faces and simpler times await. If you like the content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.